Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Shay Ali here with you on Inspired Online. And this afternoon, I've got the wonderful David Foster with us. Now, if you've not met David before, he is an incredible coach. He works with high end business people. So if you are an entrepreneur wanting to project your business into seven figures, eight figures, that sort of thing, then he knows how to do it. And he knows how to do it in less time. So how would you like to have more hours in the day to play with and create that sort of business at the same time? He is also an author. So um, about to be launched is a wonderful new book called Where's Dad, which I've had the pleasure of reading as well. Um, and yeah, I think the title says it all really because it's about um, how business people, business dads balance that, you know, business, father, balance. I'm not saying that very eloquently, but it's beautiful and it's about to be launched. And I'm really delighted that, David, you've joined me on launch day, which is amazing. So welcome to Inspired. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I'll start with our opening question, which is, if you had to share your wisdom with the world in a nutshell, what would you say? Oh, I'll answer and say, thank you for the beautiful introduction. And it means a huge amount you would even invite me on your show. So thank you for what you've created over the last few weeks and months. And um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, so thank you. Um, and wisdom, well, it, it would be two words, really. It'd just be be yourself. That would, that would pretty much be in a nutshell. Okay. Well, there's a lot of people out there that don't, they might actually have forgotten who yourself is. So how do you dig into the essence of that? It's a really good question. And um, I haven't got any silver bullets, unfortunately, or, or, or magic potions to, to kind of answer that swiftly. But what I will say is it's about having, I think, uh, a connection to curiosity really and wondering if there is if there is a different way to experience life and to to go about your day and kind of always had an intuition that there was a way that I was showing up in the world that wasn't really authentic mm. which led to kind of like um trying to morph myself into someone to please different pods of people mm. um, and when I realized I didn't have to do that and that I was kind of enough um that was great. My world started to shift from that moment, but it was, it was that kind of intuitive curiosity. There must be a different way to do life because this is pretty exhausting, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It does, actually, and it brings up um, like quite an interesting concept in my head. So this is a, a Tony Robbins concept, but I'm sure a lot of other people use it as well, and it's around the psychology of personality is what Tony Robbins calls it and other people might call it other things. But it's that concept that there's different parts of you. So there might be the part of you that's like the fire and there might be the part of you that is dad and the part of you that's business person, and part of you that's loving husband or, or whatever it is. And is there somewhere in life where you are all of those things or do you think that actually you do have to engage different parts to be different people in those scenarios? Um, I'll answer it best because I'm not familiar with sort of Tony Robbins' work. I've never really studied. I'm not yeah, obviously. But this really... is, um, you know, a general concept. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of the thing I like the concept I I like or the theory is is um someone we both know, Dr. John D. Martini. Yes. We, we we first met, right? We had this kind of seven incredible days doing his prophecy experience. Yeah. Um, but I'll never forget. But he he kind of goes on the route of actually, you know, every human being has a collection of traits that we all share, and I think last count it's five thousand one hundred and fifty traits that we all share that have been kind of recorded and documented. Wow. And yeah, which is it's kind of mind blowing actually. So no one is always kind or cruel. That they're, they're both. No one's always stingy or generous there they're kind of both mm. and it depends the traits kind of show up depending on whether you're perceiving as a human being whether someone is supporting your values the things that really drive you from the inside out or whether they're challenging those values yeah. and that that model to me just kind of makes sense if if you're aware enough to have kind of clarity on what it is that drives you, what your highest equals your highest values what they really are the things that are kind of the, the most important the biggest priorities in your life um, and I've kind of tracked that since I learned that from him a few years ago, and it just makes perfect sense to me. So um, if someone supports my values, I go, oh, they're a really kind, nice person. <laughs> if someone challenges my values, 
I then pop into the amygdala part of my, my brain and go, this person's a bit mean. I don't really like them. Like, you know, there's something not right with that particular person. I get defensive. Mm. Um, so that whole, that whole subject, that whole conversation around how we behave as humans, I think it's absolutely fascinating. And I, I know some fundamentals and I found that's been really, really useful for me. So. Mm. No, that's wonderful. Um, and, you know, there may be some contexts where you feel maybe you're not living your highest value. So um, one of the examples that you use in your book, and I know that it, it could develop some from this, is, you know, there's, there's the man. He's working really hard at his job to support his family. Mm -hmm. But actually what he's not doing in the initial stages is actually being there for the family or you know supporting uh, well he is supporting the wife by working but she feels that he's not supporting her how do you how do you balance all that so that you are living your highest values i mean what i've described as potentially superman to try and make that all happen yeah. it's, i mean it's an age-old problem isn't it really perceive it's a problem but i think um the first thing is to, to approach those kind of things in life without any any kind of judgment because let's take uh, the book for example the character ben he's a, he's an overworked uh, entrepreneur who's got a, a young son who's two years old a pregnant wife and he, he's just so focused on his business um because he thinks that's gonna the kind of the, be the one ring to rule them all the, the kind of the holy grail to sorting all these issues out in life and to him it makes sense his best thinking he's got available to him at the time it makes sense for him to be working 16 hour days and kind of ignoring his family because he's the provider. So the first thing is to kind of drop the judgment around that. And the second thing is to, I think I found the, the best method of, of kind of embracing that whole conversation, that concept around balance is to, is to communicate and to be really open and clear with communication with yourself first. Yeah. So connect with yourself and just have a very authentic conversation. What is it that I truly, truly value in life um find out your partner's highest values as well appreciate them for being an individual and have that that level of open kind of conversation where you you see each other as individuals doing their best in life um, and in the example of ben for example if he had if he had slowed down and had conversations with rebecca mm -hmm. and said you know i understand that i'm not around these are the reasons why, and this is how I see it serving the values of our family and serving you. Is there anything I can do to help? And, and kind of just have it more in the open space versus just kind of put to one side and ignored. Often for me, it's, it's what's not said that are the big problems in a relationship in any context. Yeah. So I think, I think simple terms, communication is the key. Yeah. Well, let's dive deeper into that a little bit. And we'll start with your partner, right? Um, so... How, you know there are some things that you love to say to them and there's some things that you know people think oh that can't possibly be said um what's the what tips would you have for communicating um difficult things with them okay. <laughs> in a way that's gonna land <laughs> yeah let's make, let's make it as real as we can can you give me like a an, an, not certainly an example from your life but like a made-up example that would be concrete we can play with that um hmm. Okay, um, I think the passion has gone from the relationship, like, you know, who I met was someone I was wild about. And, you know, now we're just, we're just roommates. Okay, cool. So would it be fair to say you have a disappointment there with, or you think you've got a disappointment directed to the person? Yeah, I, I will say this example isn't real, by the way. I know. We're role playing. We're role playing. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, pick so, a stage name. Pick a stage name. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll stick with the. Um, so, yeah, how, how did, did you ask? How did, how did that make me feel? If that was the. Sorry, what question? No, so, let's, let's take that as an example to play with a, a kind of a, a little communication system I learned from a guy called Steve Chandler, who's, who's my current coach. Um, really inspiring guy. He's he's written thirty five plus books, many of them best selling. Um, coached many of the world's best coaches to to kind of create heartfelt, prosperous practices. So I have to attribute this to him. It's not my stuff, um, but it works really well. So um, he's got a little model that that kind of um, when you're looking to uh, deliver some news that maybe not be the most savoury, uh, 
and to kind of push forward from that and to create something off the back of it, like an agreement. He always used this four-step model and it is you know, appreciate first. So you would say to the person, um, I really, I really, and you had to pick, pick something very specific and real that's happened in recent times. So for example, um, uh, Tracy, um, I really appreciate um, the way in which you, um, you hold yourself when you're communicating with the customers in the business. Mm. I always know they're really, really well looked after when they come to you front of house and you've got such a warmth about you that it just makes me really proud to see you embody the brand of the company. Mm. And that's the appreciation piece. And what happens then, the person's guard kind of lowers, their defenses go down and they, their heart kind of opens a bit. Yeah. And then you would go into the second stage, which is complaints. Yeah. And you say, um, However, there's something that's kind of ruffled my feathers a little bit. I wonder if we could just have five minutes to talk about it. Is that okay? Mm. She would say yes. And then you would deliver the complaint. There's this thing where I, I noticed the other day that you um, you didn't put the coffee cup in the dishwasher in the, in the office kitchen. <laughs> and oh my the reason. God, that's terrible. <laughs> oh, no, oh my God. Um, phone Shay, we need a lawyer. Um, so, and. Uh, <laughs> So, and the reason that's a problem is because it then sets a bad example for the staff and then we get in the messy office and then the customers come in and they don't come back because they think we're slobs. Um, for example, so I have a request of you. The third stage is request. What I request is, would you be an effort and agreement with me to make sure that any time you use crockery in the office kitchen, which is a heinous crime, um, you put it in the dishwasher. Is that an agreement you can make with me? And so the third stage is request and the fourth stage is agreement. So you go um, appreciation, complaint, request, agreement, and you stick in the agreement phase and you co-create an agreement with the other person is happy with. And then you kind of shake hands and it, it tends to work because you've delivered some news that maybe seen as unsavory, but you've got the person to co-sign agreement. People tend to like keeping their word oh. versus what most people do is, for God's sake, why do you leave the kitchen messy? I can't believe you've just done that. And defenses get up and we start to kind of go into a mode where we're protecting ourselves. So that's something that works really well in any context. I've used a little, you know, playful business story, but that can work with a child. It can work with a, your, your partner. It can work with a friend, a parent. Business context doesn't really matter. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. No, really cool, actually. And I think if more people did that, um, well, maybe I'd get less divorce work. Who knows? You know? Maybe. maybe. Isn't, it, isn't it one in two, Shay? Is it one in two to get divorced these days? Oh, I don't know the stats. And I mean, to be fair, I'm not the right person to ask because I see things when they've got really dark. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Unless I'm looking at, you know, friends. So friends are, you know, a different kettle of fish, but clients are not in the happiest state generally. So, um, but you mentioned like communication with children there. So let's take it back to um, the example of Ben and Rebecca in the book. Um, you know, how do you juggle that when you're like the working entrepreneur, the dad, or even maybe the mum, you know, and you don't have as much time with your little one as you'd want. You know, even now in lockdown, there are people, well, they're having to educate their children, but they're still having to run their business. And maybe, you know, now that we're coming out of it, you're thinking, oh, I wish I'd taken that time to spend with my child a bit more. So how can you balance all that? It's a really, really good question. So I saw something on Facebook today from, from another coach and he said he's got two children and it's in Australia. And I think they've both gone back to school. And he said something on the lines of, you know, a week ago I was um, dreading work. He said, now I'm, I'm, all I want to do is play catch with my sons. So he's he's realised what he had when they're at home. Now the void is exposed. And I, I think we're all going to come out of this and, and actually look at this with, with appreciation. Go, those times were very challenging, but we grew tremendously from the experiences. And one of those areas both is balance, right? And... I think it comes back to communication again. So communication, I, don't, I think it's not just about communicating adult to adult, but children are smarter than you think. So even if your child is two, three, four, five, six years old, you know, sitting them down and using simple language as the reason why you, maybe you can't be there today or tonight because you've got a project on that means the business is going to be 
good or health feels successful, which means that we can then buy that Lego set, which means I can then spend time with you on Saturday or and tr- pick something that is aligned to the child's values. Mm. Um, so I can't be with you tonight. What I can do on Saturday, we can go for a bike ride for two hours. Which is like, oh, they're great, Daddy. So you're not just hiding away from that that conversation. You're you're being open and you're being authentic. And that is doing two things. It's, it's nipping that potential conflict in, in the bud there and then, but also you're modeling for your child, your a way of being as a man, as an adult, especially if it's a boy, um, and it works with girls too, that actually it's okay to openly communicate and share how you really feel in an articulate, respectful way. And I think that's one thing that um, is, is missing in a lot of people. They, they don't have that level of open heartness with their children and sometimes relate to them as an inconvenience because their lives are so full. They forget that they chose to create a family and then they resent having a family. And it's kind of paradox really, because it is, it is one of the toughest things you can do, but also the most rewarding. So. So how do you strike that balance? You spoke about balance now, you know, an entrepreneur, well, we're both entrepreneurs actually. Um, You know, business is like your child as well. It demands a lot of your time. Um, how, how do you strike that balance? Is it really impossible? Um, I don't think it's impossible. No, I think it, it, it helps if you're doing a, a, a career, a profession, a vocation that you love. I'm, I'm very fortunate. So I, I transferred to be a coach in, in 2012, having played the game of chasing conventional success and having big wins and big failures. Mm. Um, because I thought that the model I had was you go to work doing work that you don't like to make enough money to provide for your family. Mm. It wasn't even in the realm of consciousness in our household that you could do something you love and get paid for it. Um, and when my first child was born, Rocco, I was like, I'm, I'm done with this life. I don't know what I want to do yet. Um, but I know I don't want to run these businesses. I want to help people using my experience and be a present parent. Yeah. So I think that, that helps connecting with what you value, what you love and trying to build from that place. And it takes a bit of time. It's not an overnight thing. Yeah. Um, and then, th- so the balancing then comes in. If you're connected with your professional career, you, uh, what is for me, I tend to go the extra mile. So I'm up early in the morning, up around five, five fifteen, and I'm doing an hour to two hours of you know, meditation work, writing, journaling, creative work, preparing. Yeah. And then I wake my sons up and I have that connection time with them and take them to school. And then I'm, I'm work David if you like in my business they come home we have dinner at five um, and then we generally have a bath or a, a wrestle like they beat me up and so, <laughs> literally yeah they're getting older now so now I'm kind of regretting the fact I taught them to wrestle um, and uh, and then 7 30 comes and it's like if I have anything else done, I might have a half an hour of just catching up loose ends and then I connect with my wife and weekends it's like unplugged uh, so if I was doing a business I didn't love I would find that I would have resentment to that kind of that level of um, time management and organization. Yeah. But to me, it's important to fit it, to fit it all in because I have, a, I have a high value on my coaching and teaching and creative business, if you like, mm. and a very high value on parent and family. So those two things kind of intersect quite nicely. And that's where the book came from as well. So being a parent is something to write the book as yeah. did being an entrepreneur. So it all kind of fits in holistically. Um, so it comes back to connecting with yourself um, first and, and being yourself and building from that place I think yeah um well let's talk about that concept of vision because you um mentioned that it's important to have a vision of what's important and what how do you do that you know is there anything that you can suggest to our viewers today on what they can do if they're a bit lost as to what maybe their vision is even yeah totally um, keep it really kind of basic because this, this is what I think works really really well as a like a little takeaway um, but one exercise I found useful for myself from the clients I work with so for, for both business owners and, and coaches I, I coach a lot of coaches now to help them with their practices yeah. is um, getting a blank sheet of paper on a daily basis for seven days and the first thing you do when you wake up go downstairs you might make a cup of tea or coffee or have a drink of water and just write at the top of the sheet of paper what do I want and just free stream for 10 minutes and write whatever comes into your mind. I want some toast. I, <laughs> I want to go to Barbados for a holiday. I want a new car. I want to have a X amount of, uh, of money. I want to, whatever comes to mind, top of mind, write all this stuff down and you can do it in a list, a bullet point form, 
or a mind map. So draw a circle with some circles off it. Mm -hmm. And then collect those seven days. Don't look at it. Do it and just kind of file it. Then the seven days, just slow down and take an hour or two to look at it, maybe with a highlight pen. Mm -hmm. And the ones that really call to you, just go highlight this, highlight. And that will form the foundation of some elements and building blocks of what you want to create with your life. And then it's a case of just unpacking those into a, a more intricate document that, that I do with, with clients. But that's a really, really great place to start. Well, that's wonderful. I love that, actually. I've not heard that particular exercise described. So that's okay. really well. Um, and what if you're living a life that is nothing <laughs> in relation to what you want? You, you know, I might want to live on a beach in Fiji and be catching fish for a living. And yeah, well, I'll give you a real example. Someone I actually know was a city worker. Yeah. And, um, this person said, what I actually dream of is living on a farm in India. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I was a bit silly about it originally. I'm like, I'm sure there's a lot of Indian farmers that dream of living in central London. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this was genuinely that person's desire. Um, so... You know, what would you do when it's just worlds apart like that? Um, it's difficult to know without speaking to the person, but I'll just, I'll kind of just shoot from the hip if you like. Um, that, do. that does, that doesn't sound, uh, like a dream. It sounds like a fantasy and it probably could be coming from a place of being, um, perceiving, thinking, running a story that their life is kind of drudgery, hard, nose to the grindstone. There's no way out. I need to, have this money to pay my rent and all that sort of stuff. So the the idea that the fantasy of being on a farm in India, away from the hustle and bustle of a city, could be really appealing. That could be the kind of thing that keeps them going. One day, maybe, mm -hmm. um, when actually they're being served on many many levels by having that job in the city, they're just not conscious of it mm -hmm. uh, because um, people's lives and actions speak louder than the words. So if that person really wanted to be a farmer in India they would have done it a long while ago because it, it was quite easy. You'd buy a ticket, you'd buy a farm for maybe two or three grand, take oh. some savings and go farm. Yeah. Nice. So, <laughs> yeah. so that, that's, that, I mean, that, that's, that's a very glib way of looking at it, if you like, and off the cuff, but it would take a deep conversation with the individual. But, you know, look at what people do, not what they say. Mm. And so are you a believer in, you know, what your life demonstrates is what you actually want? to some extent on some level yes on some level and it, and it depends on whether you're living if you're being self and living a life authentic to you or whether you're you're trying to be someone else to gain the approval of others so back to the book again ben kind of has a realization about that he's trying to impress his dad and his mum and trying to be this businessman he's and it's not really who he wants to be but he, he on some level that strategy makes sense to him and his coach helps wake him up and says, well, actually, look over here. You, you can be yourself and create from that place. So I think lives do represent what people truly want. But the question is, what do they truly want? And are they having authenticity? Or are they trying to gain the approval of others? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I was fascinated by this concept that, that you have about, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you can actually be more effective in less time and earn more. So before I let you go completely, can you tell us a little bit more about that? How is that possible? Unless you don't sleep. <laughs> um, dot, dot, dot. Mm. It, it depends, right? So um, a simple way to do that is to um, to install, well, firstly, be connected to the business in a really authentic way. So something that you love to do um, and understand that what got you to a certain level in your business isn't going to get you to the next level. Mm. And a lot of entrepreneurs, they start off on their own because they're technically gifted at a certain skill. Mm. They, they start to build a business, they get good, but they still hold on to too much stuff because that's all they know. Yeah. So actually letting go of stuff and finding out what your, your real zone of genius is that's going to get you to the next level is probably one of the first steps. And then going through a process of, of delegating stuff with proper management um, and systematizing simple processes in the business mm -hmm. or automating things. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a very broad 
statement, but that, that's how I tend to approach it. And it works very well. It does take a bit of time, um, but it's definitely possible. Otherwise, otherwise businesses would, would always kind of have a glass ceiling at one, one kind of area. So, but a lot of business owners, they don't like to let go because they fear it may not be done as well as they can. Things might go wrong. They actually, they could be having an affair with their business because things at home aren't great. So they like to be spread thin at work because they dread going back home because they're going to get into a row or a fight or they don't know how to be a parent because all they've known is work. So it's, it's a multitude of things that can be going on there that you kind of have to have an intimate conversation to work out the best way forward. Oh, all right. Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with us today? Um, I would say, and this is just top of mind, but in terms of the book, um, I wrote a little blog today. It's going out to my, my email list. Nice. That kind of talks about the fact the book's being published today. Mm. It's on sale in say three days. So um, on Amazon, but um, I write about the fact that I've always had a desire to, to write. Mm. Even as a young child, my, my actually my, my brother brought around a book when I was an eight-year-old that he found at my mum's house. It was like a invasion of the loud mouths. It was a book and a sketchbook I've been writing. And somewhere along the way, I kind of lost faith in myself being a writer. Mm. And I think it happened at the school when Mr. King, the English teacher, would put red pen all over my paper. I, I, started, I, read, I ran the story that I wasn't exactly. writing. Really. What did you do? <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. But this kept whispering to me about, you're going to be a writer to write so i'd write like love letters to girlfriends long emails to clients emails to my you know managers saying how they should improve their business um and and so this thing was always there this intuitive one day there's going to be something come out of me it's creative mm. and i stayed on the path and one day i just dropped all the stories and just started to write and i just literally chipped away at it yeah you know, 20 minutes half an hour a day and out of that came a my first book so what I'd love to leap it with is actually if you have that intuitive whisper that actually there's something you want to create in life, um, it really is possible just through baby step action. So, and I encourage you just to get started today and um, trust yourself. And do it. And it's a beautiful book. I would have never thought that, you know, you would tell me that you, um, well, Mr. King had a challenge with your writing. I'm not even going to say it's your challenge because that's it's beautifully written. And I know that mm. it was endorsed by Dr. John D. Martini as well. So he it was. was. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so how can people get in touch with you and where can we buy this book? Because as I said to you before we um, came on air, as it were, you know, I even had someone that was interested in it yesterday and I thought, right, okay. So well, this, this is what it looks like this is the the kind of proof copy that's that's going to be ready this evening and the first place to look is amazon.co.uk or.com be ready on on monday um, so you can find the book it's called where's dad and they can find me at a uh, simple web address it's davidfoster.coach and um, there's resources blogs articles free downloads to help you create an inspired life you love leading specifically for ambitious business owners and also coaches i'm coaching a lot of coaches now and i get a lot of joy from that so if you're a coach and you're struggling to create clients in life you want i can have a conversation with you um i think that's pretty it's pretty good pretty much <laughs> and social media yes social media. just search david foster coach on social media yeah we'll tag you in this as well so um cool. Details will be up on facebook.com forward slash inspired stage. Thank you, David. Um, last time we met, we met for a lovely dinner. So I hope that we're able to do that soon. <laughs> yeah, nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. There's a lot of change, hasn't there? So, but this has been lovely. And I, I just want to really commend you for creating this in the first place. And this is a great example of what you can do with creativity. You just took action and you've created a, an amazing string of interviews with, with great people that have served people during lockdown so i commend you for it thank you for inviting me on here it's been a real pleasure such a pleasure thank you cool thank you